My name is Charles Miller. I work for CoinGeek in London and I am a journalist and mostly with CoinGeek I am recording podcasts which we film as well now. It's a series called CoinGeek Conversations and I have been involved in this world for about a year now since last September uh, where I got a job with CoinGeek. Um, before that I was a producer at the BBC also in London and I made documentaries mostly and my sort of crossover with this world although it's still fairly remote is that I made quite a few films about the tech business um, about Amazon and Facebook and Google and stuff like that so I'm interested in the, the technology business and this is the sort of cutting edge of that today I suppose what interests you about the technology business? Is it the growth? Is it the um, the people behind it? Is it what, what is it? Well, I think it's an interesting kind of intersection, really, of um, money, technology, and the way people live. And it's just so interesting to see which aspects of that are going to drive things forward and change the way people behave because I go back as far as the widespread adoption of the internet in 95 to 99 and the first programs I did for the BBC about technology were with dot-com startups in 99 and 2000 just before the, the crash and following little startup companies then some of whom did well some of whom didn't do so well and there's a lot of parallels with what we're seeing today in the uh, crypto world and particularly in relation to BSV because because of the availability of um, space on the, the, the blockchain for transactions of different kinds you see all these startups with ideas that will be part of all sorts of different areas rather than just money. That's what's so interesting about it, I think. So you mentioned technology and money. There seems to be an inquiry which one's driving um, further. What do you think it is? Do you think it will, the, having the money aspect of Bitcoin, um, will that be the incentive that moves people to learn faster? Well, people, I, I think it's kind of often said that money is the first application of Bitcoin and obviously what we've seen in the last 18 months with the sort of rise and fall of the value of a lot of cryptocurrencies um, is you know that's why you, that makes sense to say that but it hasn't really worked in the sense that there is a proven case for the sort of continuing financial value of these coins. They're going up and down rather than up and up. So I think that what's interesting about that is that in the same way that when we saw the dot-com crash, the value of the, the industry crashed quite dramatically, but the adoption of the internet was really unaffected by that. More and more people started using the internet and it became part of everyone's lives. And if the supporters of BSV are lucky, the same thing will be happening today in relation to BSV. In other words, the money aspect will be independent of the adoption. Um, when you interviewed me, you sounded a little skeptical of how Bitcoin worked and why people would be interested to use it. And I've noticed through your interviews that there seems to be, you're getting hooked. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I'm supposed to be sceptical. That's, that's, I mean, it, if I'm interviewing somebody, then I will try to be sceptical because that will encourage them to make the case that they believe in. Yeah, absolutely. I do hear that. But I still, I hear there's some kind of, you're, I think you're, it sounds like you're satisfied with Bitcoin as um, a technology 
and you're more questioning the scepticism comes more in around how the people are working around it. Well, I think the interesting thing about all this is that the actual technology behind Bitcoin or Bitcoin SV or Bitcoin Cash has never failed as far as I can hear. That, you know, nobody is, there have been problems with, uh, you know, the exchanges and stuff like that and all sorts of problems about uses. But the actual basic technology seems to be incredibly robust. And I mean, that's pretty impressive over a you know, 10 year period. So the longer that goes on, the more confidence I think you can have in the, in the basic technology behind it all. Yes, so that's what I, I sense in your interviews now. It's like you're kind of satisfied that yeah, the technology is going to make it. And much like you said about um, the internet, it was more the startups that collapsed, but the internet made it through. Mm. So there's a really good, great comparison. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in, in the case of the internet, obviously individual websites crashed and so on. But the basic idea of the internet, which is that there are lots of different paths that a message can take between where it's being sent and where it's being received, that, you know, I think it's called packet switching or something, that is a technology that has not really gone wrong as far as I know. There's no way of stopping the message using that system, which is all the sort of redundancy built into it, to, to make it very strong and it, it seems that that is the equivalent in, in the internet world maybe. Yes. As far as Bitcoin is concerned, do you, can you see that it could be something that will um, elevate people as far as um, well, financial sovereignty is concerned and the difference that would make in the world? Is it something that you kind of have you looked at that? Like, is yes, that I mean, that... talking to uh, Lorian Gamaroff of Sempi, you know, for instance. Um, well, actually, several people have got this idea that they're I'm talking to Steve Shadows, in fact, who the podcast comes out this week. A lot of people in this world are hoping that it's going to do good in one way or another, that it's going to help people who are not well off at the moment. And there are good reasons to believe that that could be the case, but that opportunity will only exist a bit further down the line, I think. It's, I think what we're waiting for is a really undeniable case of here's something completely new that you couldn't have done on the internet that is being done on the blockchain and is working and makes sense as a business model too. I mean, you've got many elements, many of those elements are present in different ideas, but what would be really handy is if there was one thing where they all came together and there would be no question that this is going to be useful, it's going to be profitable, it's going to be easy to use, it's going to be reliable, and it's it's producing something unique that we haven't got at the moment. I, I don't know, have you got, I can't think of the example of that yet, exactly. But you're obviously starting to think for it. Well, I don't know, I mean, I'm scratching my head, but I haven't got the answer. Yeah, um, but it's, it's the question, I think that's the question for everybody that's um, being drawn to Bitcoin. It's like, what is that? Yes, so and everybody sort of thinks, well, there must be an answer. I mean, like we talk, we heard a talk from Twetch today, and there's a lot to be said for what they're doing, I think. You know, they are providing an alternative model for social media in which people are rewarded for their creativity. Well, that's, that's great. Um, and it seems to be working. But what we need is for it to be a real power in the land in order to do what I was saying. It's got the potential though, I think. Awesome. So that's what I'm meaning by that scepticism, because it seems like you're narrowing the inquiry, inquiry of what could that be. Mm, exactly. <laughs> it's already got you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, this event, Cambrian, what is your intention here? And I know you're paid by CoinGeek to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Financial, yeah. yeah, I'm paid to be here and, and enjoy the tour of the rice fields this morning and stuff. So, exactly. do I need another incentive? Well, I think, I think 
there could be really an interest in finding out what the people here are up to. I think well, that's yeah. why you're a great joint journalist. Uh, well, thank you. But I mean, yes, there's, it's a great opportunity because, I mean, what's what what's sort of nice about this event, I think, is that it's not just people sitting in the audience, being lectured, answering a question, asking a question, and then having a cup of tea or whatever. There's a real, the emphasis is on getting actual new stuff done for the first time. And the theory that lots of different groups of people, little companies coming together, could actually benefit from being each, in each other's presence. I mean, we've only had a couple of days, but the general atmosphere, I would say, says that that is working. And that, you know, people I talk to say, yeah, it's not just kind of like moral support, because I'm sitting next to somebody who's doing something similar, but they are really talking to each other about how things are done and benefiting from that, which is great. And I think they're all asking that fundamental question that you asked before. That's like getting people together and actually literally working out solutions. I, I mean, what's interesting about this is that because of the whole way that the, um, the blockchain system works in terms of mining rewards and rewards for transactions, it's slightly different from the internet in that the internet didn't require lots of transactions in order to exist. Whereas the BSV blockchain sort of does in, on, on a sort of on a long-term basis. So everybody here is not only wanting their own business idea to work, but they have a shared interest in having the whole ecosystem prosper. Because if there's not enough, not, not enough going on on the blockchain, it won't be there for anyone to use. I think the same could be said for the internet, though. Maybe it wasn't microtransactions that drove it, but it was activity. So it was people sending emails. It was people participating that kept it alive. That's what had it grow. Yes, in, in, in broad economic terms, that's right. But in this case, well, I suppose, yeah, in this case, the, the, the threat is that miners don't find it profitable to continue to support the network, and they just go away. Uh, yeah, I guess there is a similarity with the, the internet. In, in, in that case, it, it would be the um, sort of telecoms companies wouldn't bother to invest in fiber optic or whatever they needed to do. But in this case, it's an incredibly direct economic incentive. Pat, are you finding yourself now having conversations with other journalists that are curious about it and finding yourself in a position of knowledge, whereas you weren't before? Yes, I was rather pleased, actually. I got a call from um, a journalist at the BBC saying, you know, can I talk to you? I want to, you know, catch up in what's going on in, in your world. And, uh, you know, the idea that I actually sort of know something that a journalist might want to know is rather gratifying after a year. <laughs> the, well, it's really a short amount of time. And considering it's interviews, or have you been studying as well? Well, I do a little bit of reading and stuff, of course, yeah. But I haven't been on a course. <laughs> there well, aren't any courses, really, are there? There are some online courses, but they're mostly the technical. Oh, courses. yes, yes, there's all that. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I know, I, I've sort of come to accept, which I didn't at the beginning, that there is going to be a level of technical explanation that I'm just never going to quite get. And I'm, I've sort of... I'm more relaxed now because I have accepted that. Whereas to start with, I thought my job is going to be to really understand everything about how this works. Whereas now I'm pitching myself, I'm, well, I'm sort of letting myself not worry about that and sticking to the aspects of it that people in more general world, uh, sort of circles can relate to. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if, if you write about the internet, you don't have to know everything about how a microchip works, you know. Awesome. <laughs> and your journalist friend, did they walk away, want, how do you think they walked away, wanting to know more? Were they satisfied? Um, Were they curious? I haven't been available yet. I've been too busy to talk to him, so you'll have to wait. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question that we've been asking everybody. 
and just curious because I, I, I'm curious to hear your answer. Where do you see yourself fitting in the future of Bitcoin? Well, um, I am interested in sort of the history of technology, actually. I'm doing some studying on that separately. I'm doing, I'm doing a, a master's degree in history, actually. Um, and I sort of would like to, um, you know, to, to, to feel that I've got a record of this time in this area in the same way that I produced material that was a record of the sort of glory days of the dot-com boom. So I hope that I can accumulate knowledge and accumulate material or content that I've created that will add up to sort of being somebody who sort of documents this particular moment in time, yeah. Awesome.